Hello, listeners, and welcome to the Sailing the East podcast. I'm Bela Musitz. This is our podcast about sailing the East Coast of the United States. In some episodes, we will focus on passages and destinations. In other episodes, we will talk about boats, equipment, and techniques. And when we come across an interesting person, we'll try to get them as a guest on the show. As our frequent listeners can tell, I am doing this episode solo today, as my co-host, Mike Wasserman, could not make it. So thank you for tuning in to today's podcast. Today, we're going to talk about marine surveys and my experience when we purchased Paradox back in September of 2020. Paradox is a 2009 Hunter 45 Dexalon. You know, it's been nine months since we took possession of Paradox. It is late June in 2021 as I record this podcast. So we've used Paradox for about three months so far this season. We purchased Paradox from her original owner, and she had just under 200 hours on the engine. Now that's a very lightly used boat. Other boats of that vintage we looked at typically had at least 700 hours on the engine, and some were even as high as 3,000. So Paradox was not used very much. And I will say, the previous owner took wonderful care of her, so she was in tip-top shape. Again, some other boats we looked at clearly had significant wear and tear, and they showed their age. And as with all things, whether you're buying a previously owned house, or a car, or a bicycle, you can usually tell if the owner took care of it. Things are clean, there's no scratches or nicks in things, there's no broken latches or hinges, stuff just looks good. And this was certainly the case with Paradox. And the excellent condition and low hours were a strong selling point for us in purchasing this boat. During the purchasing process, we had a survey done of the boat. A survey is like a home inspection you may have done during buying a house or taking a used car you're about ready to buy to a mechanic to check it out before you make the purchase. You are just trying to get a set of trained eyes to look things over and find anything that is not obvious to you. In addition, if you're getting a loan on your boat, the loan company may require a survey. Also, many insurance companies require a survey before they will issue an insurance policy. So in the marine industry, it's something you almost have to do. There are several marine surveying accrediting organizations. They are all similar, and I am sure one can argue for or against which one is better. One of them, the Society of Accredited Marine Surveyors, has its roots in the International Maritime Technical Institute Conference held in Brunswick, Maine, during the latter part of 18, uh, 18 excuse me, of 1986. SAMS, as it's called, is a nonprofit corporation in the state of Florida, and it's intended to be an organization of professional marine surveyors who have come together to promote the good image and general well-being of their chosen profession. I've taken that right from their website. So SAMS, a, a SAMS accredited marine surveyor, uh, are surveyors who have accumulated time in the profession and have demonstrated the technical skills necessary for the designation as a uh, SAMS accredited marine surveyor. There is though the Surveyor Associate Program. This is an opportunity for less experienced members to participate in SAMS and hone their skills under the tutelage of an accredited marine surveyor in their local area. So if you're interested in becoming a marine surveyor, this is a process for doing that. To be a SAMS accredited marine surveyor, you must be currently practicing marine surveyor with at least five years of surveying experience accumulated within the past 10 years. So applicants must also affirm that they will abide by the bylaws and code of ethics of standards and official decisions and amendments to such Society of Accredited Marine Surveyors or SAMS. So SAM has a set of surveying standards that the surveyors must follow. In other words, the organization defines, here's the proper way to survey a boat, here's the systems you need to look at, 
uh, here are the things that you need to inspect so that there's consistency from a surveyor to surveyor. Um, and there's also actually a written exam uh, that you uh, have to pass. And uh, you also need to uh, do a certain amount of continuing education uh, through uh, every other year or so. So it's really interesting. Uh, and one of the other organizations that ve that's very similar is the National Association of Marine Surveyors. Uh, and there's also yet another one, the, United, the U.S. Surveyors Association. So there's several of these accrediting organizations uh, that are, you know, industry groups, I'll call them, or member associations where people join and, and they follow the rules and bylaws and then they can uh, hang that uh, moniker on their, or put it on their business card to say, hey, I'm a member of the National Association of Marine Surveyors or I'm a member of SAMS and it gives people some credibility. Because you have to remember that there are no state or federal licenses or any specific requirements needed to become a marine surveyor. So it's not a state or federally regulated industry. So theoretically, you could call yourself a surveyor tomorrow and get started uh, and hang up your shingle, uh, do your website, and you can go. Now the challenge there is that the insurance company or the loan company will often want uh, the the surveyor to be accredited by one of the major organizations, either SAMS or the National Association of Marine Surveyors uh, or the U.S. Surveyors Association. So if you're getting a loan or you're getting insurance, you better check with them uh, to make sure if they have any specific requirements for the marine surveyor. I think most organizations accept, accept SAMS and the National Association of Marine Surveyors, as well as the U.S. Surveyors Association. Uh, so we hired a, a marine surveyor uh, who was uh, both with SAMS and with the uh, National Association of Marine Surveyors, or NAMS, as it's sometimes called. So he was accredited by both. Uh, so what does a surveyor do? Well, a surveyor typically goes through all of the systems on the boat, checks the hull and the deck for water damage or water intrusion. Uh, they may also do a rig inspection and test the oil in the engine and transmission and generator if they're so equipped. Uh, and our surveyor did both of those uh, as well. Uh, many surveyors do not do rig inspections. A rig inspection means you got to get hoisted up the mast and you look over all of the standing rigging. Um, and uh, many of them do not do oil test. Uh, the reason you want to do an oil test is to see what kind of particles are in the engine oil and transmission oil or the generator. Uh, and if there's metal particles in there, then that tells you something may not be wearing properly. Uh, so our surveyor did both of those. Uh, so, you know, you have to make sure uh, you ask what systems they will be checking. So I, I talked to, I believe it was four or five marine surveyors. Uh, you know, I asked, I interviewed them. I, I called them up, spent about 15 minutes with them. And, you know, if someone's too busy to spend that time with you, I think that's a warning sign. I mean, you're paying them a fair amount of money. We'll talk about that later. Uh, but I had conversations with them, asked them, you know, what systems they check what their experience is. Have they uh, surveyed uh, similar boats? In other words, have they surveyed a Hunter 45 Dexalon in the past? Or uh, have they surveyed other Hunters in sort of that size category? Because manufacturers tend to, uh, you know, across models do things similar. Any particular manufacturer does things kind of in the same way, even across models. Uh, so let me just step back here uh, and, and talk about water intrusion. I, I mentioned that earlier. You know, one of the important things that they do that's difficult for the average person to do, at least when I observe the surveyor, I'd say, hmm, you know, I mean, I know how to turn on the air conditioning. I know how to turn on, you know, the shower, see if the water pump works and stuff like that. Um, but one of the things they did was they, they checked for water intrusion into the hull and deck. So what does this mean? So some boats have solid fiberglass hulls and decks, and other boats have a cord hull 
or a chord deck, and some have a combination of sort of solid and chord. So what does that mean? So chord means there are actually several layers of fiberglass put down in a mold, then a core material. Core material historically has been balsa wood or some other type of light wood. And then there's more fiberglass layers put on top of it in the mold. Uh, in some newer boats, they use a synthetic material, uh, kind of a foam material. And, and the reason people do cord uh, is that it has a higher strength to weight ratio than solid fiberglass. It's sort of a sandwich construction. There's a couple layers of fiberglass, then there's a, a, this cord material, and then uh, and some other layers of fiberglass. And that gives you a, a very high uh, strength to weight ratio. And, and the boat manufacturers borrowed that from, you know, airplane manufacturers. Uh, they, they, they make uh, cord materials uh, or laminate materials in, in all sorts of things in airplanes. However, one of the disadvantages of hulls and decks that are cored, particularly with wood, is that if water enters into that space where the wood is, the wood will eventually rot. And then you actually have a significant reduction in the strength of that component or that part of the hull or the deck. So you may be waiting, well, wait a minute, how does water get into the wood? It's surrounded by fiberglass on, on all sides. Well, that's true, but you know, there's about a few hundred screw holes and bolts used to fasten all sorts of things to the hull and deck. And each one of these holes that's drilled is a possible place for water to get in. And you also have to remember you have hatches that are uh, openings for hatches that are cut into the decks. There's through hulls uh, for that are cut into the hull. Uh, so all for whether they be, you know, through hulls for uh, water intake or water discharge. Uh, there's all sorts of sensors like your depth gauge, uh, your knot meter sensor. Uh, these are all holes that are made in the boat. Um, and so those are all places for water to get in. Of course, if they're made properly and, and put together properly, all of them are sealed with some sort of sealant to keep the water out. But, you know, over time, you know, 15, 20, 30 years, uh, sometimes that sealant breaks down uh, and water can work its way in. And, and if water gets in there, it sort of rots the wood, which is not a great thing. So that's one of the things, one, I think in my mind, one of the big things you want to surveyor to, to look for, because if you do have that condition, it's not an easy repair. Um, you, you, you basically have to cut off the top or bottom layer of fiberglass, replace the wood or the cord material, and then refiberglass over everything. So that's a big deal if you have significant water intrusion. So the, it's interesting how they do this is, is they have a little uh, hard rubber mallet uh, that they walk around and they tap on the hull and the deck. And depending upon how the sound is, I, you know, if it sounds hollow, um, they, they can tell that, hmm, something's going on here. It shouldn't sound hollow. And, um, and that's, a, that's a skill, you know, when he was going around tapping on the boat, it all sounded the same to me. And, and there were a couple places where he sort of focused on a little bit. And, and then he actually confirms uh, whether there's water intrusion or not with a moisture meter. So he has this electronic device that he holds on the surface of the fiberglass and somehow magically it can measure if there's uh, water um, in the fiberglass or in, in the layers uh, there. So that was kind of neat. Uh, and it's certainly something that I can't do. Uh, but I will say that many of the other things the surveyor did are just some good, hard common sense. Um, but he's a trained person. He, you know, they're, they're trained to find things and to point those out. And, and you hire them, you, the buyer, hire the surveyor. So they're working for you. So that, you know, that's also an, an, an another important thing. So speaking of hiring, how much does it cost? So again, I talked to five or six surveyors. And uh, a boat the size and complexity of Paradox, which, again, is 45 feet long, they were charging anywhere from $25 to $35 a foot to survey the boat. So 45 times 25 gives you an idea of, of how much that is. 
Uh, now, you also have to remember one of the things they do want to survey is they you want to get the boat lifted out of the water because you want to inspect the things that are underwater. You, you can't see them. So um, you have to go to marina uh, to lift the boat out of the water so that uh, the surveyor can look at the rudder, the keel, and the hull, and the propeller, the propeller shaft, etc. cetera. And uh, this is an, an additional expense. You know, you have to find a marina that can do this. You have to schedule it. And this is something the broker usually takes care of for you from the point of view of scheduling it, setting it all up. Uh, and this is called a short haul. So they just pick the boat up, uh, they drive it over some land, they let it hang there for a while, and, and then they put the boat back in the water. And, and typically, many marinas do this over lunch. So uh, they can pick the boat up out of the water, they drive it forward over the land, uh, then the, the surveyor has about an hour to do his thing uh, on the hull and the keel and the rudder. And then the, the guys come back and they put the boat back in the water. This way it doesn't tie up their lift, uh, you know, which is a, a, a very valuable resource, uh, their travel lift. It doesn't tie it up uh, at the marina. And so that's typically the, the way that goes. And a short haul uh, typically costs anywhere from 10 to $15 a foot. And the prices I'm telling you are, you know, I'm up in New England. Uh, this was done in Rhode Island. And you can be other parts of the country uh, where the prices can be significantly more or they can be significantly less. Uh, I know down in uh, parts of Maryland and Virginia and North Carolina, South Carolina and Florida, Georgia, the, the prices uh, can be significantly less. Uh, so you can see a survey, you, you, you know, you fork over a little bit amount of money and, and that's okay. And I will say that, you know, when the, Surveyor was there. Remember, you, uh, you the buyer, uh, hire the surveyor. Uh, and I shadowed him. I sort of followed him around uh, as he went around the boat. Uh, he was very willing to answer questions. Uh, he was very, you know, helpful. He pointed out certain things. Um, and so, you know, the guy's got a lot of experience. Uh, the gentleman we hired was a bit older. You know, he was probably in his 60s, I would say, late 50s, early 60s. And, you know, was a sailor himself. Uh, and uh, so he knew a lot about boats and had been a surveyor for a long time. Um, you know, the, the end product of, of what, he, what he gives you is a report. Uh, and the report for our boat, uh, Paradox, was 24 pages long. It had, you know, a lot of boilerplate in it, you know, like the specs from the boat, the serial numbers, dimensions of the boat, et cetera. And, and I think this is you know, in there predominantly uh, for the insurance company uh, and the loan company. I mean, they want to, you know, make sure what you're telling them is actually what, what exists. Um, and then uh, the, 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 and it kind of describes what they did. And it, it, the rest of the report is sort of organized into four sections. Um, and, and so these are sort of the action items or the findings of the surveyor. So the, the one section is legal requirements. In other words, are there any things that need to be done to the boat in order to meet United States Coast Guard requirements? Now, for example, uh, are there a sufficient number of life jackets on board? Are they of the right type? Uh, are the signal flares expired? Um, you know, those are things that, uh, you know, often you can find on a boat uh, is there a throwable device, right? So it's those types of things that, you know, if the Coast Guard boarded you, they're going to check for certain things and, and fire extinguishers, for example. Uh, you, you have to have a certain number of those, et cetera. So that was sort of one, uh, one uh, list that, uh, that he organized his report into. Uh, the next group is safety recommendations. So not legal things, uh, but things that uh, you should probably do before you take the boat out anywhere. So, for example, you know, are the fire extinguishers, they might be there, but do they need to be recharged? Uh, or is there, you know, maybe a non-working bilge pump? You know, something that's pretty important that you want to take care of. Uh, or maybe, you know, the smoke detectors or the carbon monoxide detectors are, are not working properly. Uh, the third group um, is things that sort of 
what he labeled it as requiring immediate attention. So replacing batteries, uh, maybe like the house batteries might be low and they're not going to give you sort of the type of life that you want. You can't go out cruising all day and, and you're going to end up with a dead battery at the end of the day. Um, and the fourth uh, category is sort of normal maintenance items, uh, things like replacing uh, worn zincs, uh, lubricating seacocks, uh, things that you sort of have to do anyway. Maybe the engine oil is due to be changed, uh, et cetera. So, you know, it's, it's organized well into categories uh, that, are, that are helpful. And the report on Paradox um, was pretty short of things to fix or repair. Um, and expect this, again, the previous owner took really good care of the boat, so there wasn't a lot of stuff that popped up here. So one of the big things was that the house batteries, uh, Paradox has two large uh, house batteries. House battery meaning this is what powers the lights, uh, the radio, all that type of stuff. Most, bo most boats have a house battery, which is used for powering everything on the boat except starting the engine. There's a separate battery for starting the engine. So the house batteries, which are large, you know, about 100 pounds a piece, and there's three of them, um, were at 50% capacity. In other words, their useful life was, was been reduced or their capacity is 50% of what the label says on it. And this is typical with batteries as they age their ability to hold a charge decreases. Um, and these batteries were, I think, five years old. They're uh, simple lead-acid batteries. And his recommendation was, you know what, you probably want to replace these relatively soon. Uh, another thing that he found was that the signal flares were expired. You know, the flares that you buy for a boat to, to signal people that you need help, you're in distress, they have expiration dates on them. And, and they're pretty short. Uh, the, the flares are, I think, two years at the most from the time you buy them and, and then the expiration date. Uh, is kind of, I still keep old flares on the boat uh, because you'll find that they work, uh, but you got to keep flares on the boat that are not expired uh, because that is a Coast Guard requirement. Uh, another thing he found was that the prop shaft stuffing box uh, needed some adjustment. Um, stuffing box is the, you know, the prop shaft goes through the hull and the prop shaft has to spin because it spins the propeller. One end of it's connected to the propeller, the other end it's connected to the, to the motor. Uh, and since it goes through the hull in a hole, you got to seal that opening somehow. And uh, there's many different ways of doing it, but the uh, most common is a stuffing box. And these things, uh, uh, need adjustment on occasion. So that wasn't a big deal. Um, the, the engine room on Paradox has an automatic uh, fire extinguisher, which means that if the temperature gets too hot in there, uh, that fire extinguisher automatically discharges. Uh, there's also a button on the engine control panel where I can discharge that fire extinguisher. And, and that uh, fire extinguisher system was overdue for an inspection. So that, that was an, another thing that uh, he pointed out in the report. And there's a, um, the last thing that he had in the report that, that should be done is there's a, a, a covering, a, a box that covers uh, where the wires from the mast go through the hull and the cover's there to keep water out and stuff. And he said that needed to be rebedded or reseeded. So a pretty short list of stuff. Uh, oh, and I'll, I'll also mention something that uh, the insurance company, I didn't, you know, I was naive about this one. Uh, the insurance company, uh, when they issued the policy, because uh, they w weren't going to issue the policy until they saw the surveyor's report, they said, you have to fix all of these items in the surveyor's report. And I think they gave me like 30 days uh, to, fix the, to fix them. And um, since the boat was being pulled out of the water like uh, two weeks after I got it, um, they actually gave me till next spring. I said, Hey, it's going to be on the hard. It's going to be out of the water. They said, fine, you, you have till, you know, spring to fix those, but anything in that report, you're probably going to have to take care of. So the reason I wanted to do this podcast is because now it's been, as I said earlier, nine months since the survey, 
you know, five of those months, the boat was sitting on the hard. Uh, but the last three months, she's been in the water and we've been using the boat. So what did the surveyor miss? Well, I'm happy to report not too much, but there are a few things. And, you know, one can argue some of these things have happened since the survey as part of normal use. Uh, but my guess is they were there during the survey, but we sort of missed them. Uh, and in my mind, they should have been found. The big one, the big thing that I think we missed was there a paradox has two air conditioning units. Uh, one for the, for the salon and the forward cabin and another one for the rear cabin. And uh, so the main air conditioning unit, the one that cools the um, uh, forward cabin and the salon doesn't work. We had a hot day a few weeks ago and went to turn it on and lo and behold, turned on, but it didn't cool. And, you know, I do remember turning them both on during the survey. And then it was a cool day in September, so it was hard to tell if they were actually cooling. Uh, you know, basically what we did is we turned them on. We could hear the compressor kick on. We could, you know, it was blowing air. And we said, okay, it works. And, uh, and, and well, it turns out it doesn't. And, you know, that's about a $2,000 bill for a replacement uning, unit. And that's assuming I do all of the work. I do the install, the removal, et cetera. Uh, it's probably double that if, if I'm going to hire some folks to do it. Um, so that was a, a, an oversight, I think. Uh, that's going to be a, a $2,000 bill. Um, another thing uh, that, we, that has since cropped its head is um, the boat has two shower stalls uh, in the heads. Each head ha has two heads, and in each head there's a shower stall. Uh, and each of these shower drains are connected to a pump. And this pump uh, pumps the, sh the, the drain water out of the shower. Uh, and that's sort of how you get rid of the water. Uh, and here again, I remember turning on the pumps and hearing them run uh, during the survey, but we did not actually run water in the shower to see if the pump actually pumps. So it turns out that both pumps, uh, when we went to use the shower earlier in this, this spring here when we launched a boat, uh, Actually, I discovered this when I was winterizing the boat because I, I pour winterizing fluid down into the drains uh, to, to pump them out and make sure there's no standing water in there. And that's when I discovered that, gee, they don't really pump very reliably. They would pump, but it was sort of intermittent. And uh, so it turns out uh, both pumps, again, don't pump, and the pump diaphragms uh, needed to be replaced. So it's not an expensive fix. I mean, the parts, I think, were like 35 or $40 for each pump. Uh, but I'll tell you, it took me about a half a day to figure out what was wrong with the pumps. And if you're more interested in that, uh, I discussed this in a bit more detail in episode 30, um, which was about the shower pumps and my saga in trying to figure out what was going on. So both of those pumps did not work. Um, Paradox also has a generator. And, you know, we turned the generator on during the survey. It started fine. It generated the appropriate amount of electricity. We could turn on all the other things in the boat. Uh, but what we missed was that the raw water pump was leaking and the seal needed to be replaced. I discovered that this spring when I turned on the generator and was changing the oil and checking some things in it. Uh, and this is a normal maintenance item, but it was pretty clear to me that it had been leaking for a while. And, and the generator is uh, inside a soundproofing box. So you have to take the soundproofing box off to actually visually inspect the water pump. Uh, because I could see that water had been dripping out of it because uh, areas around there were rusty from the salt water dripping there. So it's another thing that was missed. And then uh, the chart plotter um, has uh, Navionics. Uh, as the uh, software uh, for all of the charts. And the subscription to Navionics, that's a, a subscription base to keep it updated, uh, had expired actually over a year ago. And again, we turned on the chart plotter uh, and it worked and we were able to move around in it and see various different things, but we did not notice the notice that quickly pops up and tells you your subscription is expiring um, when you turn the chart plotter on. 
so we missed that. Uh, again, not a big deal. I think it's like 90 bucks to uh, renew your Navionics subscription for the chart plotter. And uh, there's a deck light that was not working. So about ha halfway up the mast, uh, there's a light that shines down and illuminates the deck. So you can see things on the deck if you're working on a boat or you need to get up there at night to change sails or something like that. Uh, you can have some light. And I'll tell you, I, I remember checking the navigation lights and they all worked at the survey, but I do not recall whether we turned on the deck light or not uh, during the survey. And uh, regardless, it doesn't work. I still haven't figured out what's going on with that one. Um, I, I'm trying to run down some wiring and then if that doesn't solve it, maybe the bulbs burned out and I got to go up to mass to fix that. So, uh, six months into this, or, uh, you know, I should say, excuse me, nine months into it from the survey, not a big list of, uh, things, not an expensive list except for the AC unit. Uh, but Hey, what's the lesson learned here? So this is what I want to leave you with. Uh, my, the lesson learned here is if you, if you sort of read between the lines of the things we found is don't just turn stuff on, right? Turn it on and let it run. And if it's supposed to be a pump, then make sure it's pumping. <laughs> if it's supposed to be an air conditioning unit, then make sure it's cooling the air. Uh, put it through its paces, right? Make sure it's working properly and, and you're not just, uh, oh yeah, it runs, that's fine. We're, 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 we're in good shape. And, you know, uh, there are some big items and there's some not so big items. And, it, it, you know, you don't want to miss any big items, that's for sure. But if you're paying someone to check over the boat, they should cover it all. And I think, you know, overall, I was pleased with the survey and the surveyor. Uh, he did a good job. And on the scale of 1 to 10, I think I'd give him an 8. Uh, and that's just because, you know, he missed he missed these the air conditioner thing. I think, you know, and, and I, you know, I could say, well, I should have pushed him harder on that. Uh, one could certainly make that point. Um, but at the same time, you know, I was paying him to do that. Um, and you got to remember the boat had very little wrong with it, right? The boat was in really good shape. I mean, for an 11 year old boat, that's not a long list of things um, that were, that were wrong that he found, uh, you know, and I will say uh, survey day, as I like to call it, felt a bit rushed, you know, in addition to myself being there and the surveyor uh, also at the uh, survey was the owner, uh, the selling broker, and my broker were there. So we had a bunch of people there, uh, many of them motivated <laughs> not to find stuff and to make sure that, you know, this doesn't blow up the, the sail going through on the boat. Um, so there's lots of points of view of various different things. And all in all, everybody was fine uh, and helpful. But, uh, you know, it is, it is what it is. And, you know, we also had a specific time to be at the haul out marina for the short haul and the hull inspection. So, you know, we got to the boat in the morning. It was in a different marina because the marina the boat was at did not have a, a lift to pull the boat out. So we had to take about a 15-minute ride in the boat to get to the other marina. Uh, so, you know, we had a schedule. We also had to sort of m manage and juggle. So I think, you know, if you're considering buying a boat, in addition to being there with the surveyor for the sur survey, and, you know, again, not just turning stuff on, but putting it through its paces the best you can. I think next time if I was buying a boat, I would say that I want to come to the boat uh, for a day by myself. Uh, the owner can be there, of course, or the, the selling broker. Or, or I don't care if other people are there. But I want to spend the day just sort of crawling through the boat, turning stuff on, letting it run, uh, and I would, I, I would, I want to do this. I would want to do this uh, prior to the survey, so that anything that I find, uh, I can point out to the surveyor, uh, and he can he can verify it, and then that way include it in the report. And why is it important to include it in the report? Uh, well, uh, the downside is if it's in the report, you're probably going to have to fix it for the insurance company. But the good side is that. Um, the reason you want to have stuff in the report, the surveyor's report, is, is because things uncovered during the survey give you grounds to either walk away 
and get your deposit back, right? So if something major was found in a survey, uh, like the engine's bad, uh, or the engine oil has, you know, lots of metal shavings in it, so something's not right, you can basically walk away up to that point. Uh, once you accept the survey, then if you walk away after that, you're, you're losing your deposit. Uh, and the deposit is typically 10%. Um, so the survey is important uh, because, number one, you can walk away if there's major things found or minor things found. You can renego renegotiate the price. You know, so, for example, if the air conditioning would have been found, I could have said, hey, listen, this should be working. I didn't expect this, so I want a price reduction of, of you know, two or $3,000 or whatever. Uh, so that's also another good reason to, to do this, and that's why I would do it before the survey so that I can point it out to the surveyor, and then he can put it in, in the report. I would do my visit to the boat, uh, turning stuff on uh, prior to the survey. So, you know, another thing is don't rush take your time you know use it as a learning experience um, surveys are important everyone recommends them uh, I'm glad I did ours and um, I think enough said about all of this so let's wrap up this episode so listeners thanks for joining us for another episode uh, I hope you found today's podcast interesting and thought-provoking and if you have questions or suggestions for the podcast, please get in touch, touch with us. Our email is sailingtheeast at gmail.com. You know, we always enjoy hearing from our listeners. And if you enjoy the podcast, hit that follow button on your podcasting app. That hit, the more people who follow us, the more we sort of go up in search engine responses or search engine results, and it's easier for other uh, listeners or who are interested in these types of podcasts to find us. So yeah, hit that follow button. And if you'd like to support the podcast, you know, at the bottom of the show notes that you can find in your podcasting app, you'll actually see a link that says support this podcast. If you click on that link, uh, it's going to take you to Anchor, which is our podcasting host. And you can make a pledge there for as little as 99 cents a month uh, to help defer the cost of producing the show. So we really would appreciate that. You know, we're going to be spending most of the summer sailing around Narragansett Bay, Long Island Sound, and Buzzards Bay. I hope to see you out on the water. Uh, Paradox is the name of the boat, and uh, I hope uh, we could meet uh, some of our listeners face-to-face uh, -face on the water. So until next time, signing off from upstate New York. See you soon. Mm -hmm.